Yeah, it's funny. Like, I always joke that I'm like, I have a Virgo moon, right? And so I really like to solve my feelings. Like, if I don't have a purpose, why am I feeling them? Especially with my undefined soul reflexes. I'm like, what's the point of this? Especially that <laughs> mental definition. It's going to yeah. really make sense of it. Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves. I'm your host, Jessica Locke, a holistic mindset, strala yoga, and human design guide. This podcast is not about telling you what to do. It's about sharing stories and tools to connect to your inner wisdom and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. Because deep down, only you know what's best for you. We'll be talking mindset, business, recovering from burnout, human design, transitions, and so much more. Let's dive in, shall we? Hi! Today we have a very, very special guest, Kate Marode, and I met her a few years ago, I think, already in human design training. She was one of our mentors, and there's so much I want to ask her about. I admire her from far away. I watch her. I'm like, what is she doing? She brings such a gentleness, ease in the way that she guides and show up. So yeah, I'm excited to have a conversation with her and opening the floor, Kate, no pressure. Introduce yourself to our listeners. Who are you? Who's Kate Merle? Oh my gosh. Who am I? Um, Let's see. I am... Well, human design wise, I am a three six self projected projector. Astrology wise, I am a Leo Sun Aries rising Virgo Moon, so a lot of fire with a little bit of Earth grounding us all down. <laughs> um, I have been a yoga and movement teacher for thirteen years. I have been an embodiment coach and creative consultant, creativity coach, all of those things for eleven years now, twelve years, somewhere in there. And I love to gather people together to make art, to go on adventures, and to just enjoy life. I think that's what it's all about. We're here to enjoy life. I think that's the whole point. And however I can support people to do more of that, that's what I like to do. How did you find that work or how did the work find you? Yeah, I um, I was always really drawn to different like mythology and archetype and spirituality like philosophies I was that kid in high school that was like reading mythology books and <laughs> you know doing all of that and I, I started practicing yoga regularly after an injury that I got because I used to play competitive ultimate frisbee in university and so what? <laughs> yeah, I competitive I love ultimate that. Frisbee for seven years um <laughs> and I started doing yoga as part of my rehab from a knee injury and I had already been sort of familiar with some of like the philosophies of yoga and so getting into the practice it was actually the first time that it was really hard I hated it like I loved it and I hated it because I had been playing sports my whole life I had really like internalized that idea that like you have to go hard or you go home like you play through injury you do all these things like it wasn't like movement wasn't really about being present with my body even though I I liked how it felt to move my body right but yoga was the first time I had to slow down and actually feel what was happening inside of me and it was really hard <laughs> um and so a couple of years after that I knew that I wanted to to teach and share that with other people and to share that like experience of actually slowing down and feeling and discovering new ways of being with yourself and so I kind of started in like in the yoga place, I always tell people like I accidentally became a fitness instructor through that because the place that I learned to teach yoga also had like they needed teachers for other things. So I learned to teach like cycle and bar and kettlebells and adult gymnastics and like all of these things that like I never, I know. Oh, cool. <laughs> and it, so it feels cool. like a whole different lifetime at this point because this was, oh my gosh, what? Yeah, 13, 12, 13 years ago. Um, but what I really found like through all that, I was tandemly still like deeply studying like philosophy and spirituality. It's like also when I started to really get into personal development. Um, and I just felt like there was so much more than just the physical part. And so I got a couple of certifications in facilitating like, like possibility thinking and facilitating like emotional experience and like all of that. I don't even remember what the names of the certifications were at this point. Right. But I started to um, invite my private yoga and fitness clients into like a different kind of sort of coaching experience where the movement happened, but it was also 
let's move, like, let's talk about what's going on in your life, what you're wanting to accomplish, what you're like, how you're feeling. And let's create movement practices that actually support where you want to go. And like, will help you feel your way through that. So that's kind of how I got started way back in the day. And it, it's a long spiraling road <laughs> from there as, as it is with the third line. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And all the identities that you've taken as part of your open undefined G center as well. I actually have a Defined G Center. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. You're self-projected. Yeah. I thought you were a mental projector. Are you a mental projector no. or self-projected? No. Self-projected, oh, yeah. <laughs> gosh, that's... Yeah. Tell me more about that. It's a little bit of a tangent, but <laughs> when oh, you I learn like about human design, you know, how did that hit? Yeah. Land? I mean, so I first I first learned about human design in 2012. Um, I was working for, <laughs> among all the other things I was doing, I was... <laughs> working for a business coach at the time, like doing some admin and marketing support for her. Cause I also have a degree in art and graphic design and like, you know, all these other things too. So, love it. Love it. Yeah. Um, and she, she was bringing human design to her clients and also then to the people who were working for her. And it was the first time, like learning that I was a projector was like mind blowing. Um, because I was definitely in the, like, in a pretty consistent cycle of work, 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 burnout, get sick hard reset, work, 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 <laughs> you know, get sick, burn out and have to like reset. And that like constant inner voice of like, why can't I keep up with everybody? Like what's wrong with me? Like what I'm like, I, when I learned about projector bitterness, I was kind of had that like, Whoa, that hit, you know, <laughs> I mean, I think I'm only like 22 and I was like, I have had a lot of bitterness. <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah. And then it's interesting because at the time, learning about being a self-projected projector, there wasn't actually a lot of information out there. And the person that I learned it from basically was like, basically said like, oh yeah, you just need to talk and figure out your stuff from there. And I like, didn't, I was like, okay. Like <laughs> I could tell that she just didn't really know. I think she was a generator and she just like, didn't know what to offer me, which was totally fine. Like I feel like I didn't, I almost appreciate that in hindsight because I didn't have any preconceived notions of like what my authority was supposed to be like. Yeah. Um, I just knew that I had that like that consistent sense of self and resonance that I've like I have always felt that like there's always this moment whether even whether whether I'm talking or not like there's this feeling in me of like this is me or like ooh that's not that I'm not there like I'm not on that in that spot right. Um, yeah. And then the more I learned about it, the more I realized like so much of it made sense. Like how every time I create something, it feels like I'm putting my literal soul out into the world. <laughs> like I can't separate very far from my work and my creative projects in the world because it literally is like me expressing out and there's no getting away from that. So I do my best to embrace it. Right. Right. And I can imagine the vulnerability of being seen yeah in that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and it's it's something I used to think that like oh eventually I'll get over this or like oh if I do enough healing or mm. get high vibe enough then I won't have to worry about feeling that like vulnerability and then recognizing that's never gonna happen and it actually was preventing me from creating a lot of the time because I like I, there's a lot of perfectionist tendencies in me to be, like it has to be perfect before I put it out so that people don't judge me <laughs> right right and like being in the coaching industry for so long I'm sure like obviously you've also been through transformation as you guide other people and noticing certain practices that are so helpful and at the same time they can sort of gaslight us and just finding the balance of like how do we support ourselves show up for ourselves and also recognize the tender vulnerable parts how has that journey been for you in this industry yeah I think the biggest the biggest one is like having a having a positive mindset I think because I I mean growing up I was always told like I mean I was I was like a happy child I was always smiling I didn't cry very much and like I do feel you know, so much of my work is about like joy and connecting to that like innocence and wonder and like curiosity and like fun in life. Um, but I also, you know, reading a lot of positive psychology and self-development, personal development books when I was a teenager, when I was in my 20s, it felt, um, and I didn't even realize it at the time, but it, 
like I was really pigeonholing myself into like, if you're not positive, if you're not happy, then something's wrong with you. And I think there, that, there is this underlying message. I think that shows up a lot of the time of like, if you can just think positively, if you can just be optimistic, then you won't be sad or angry or upset ever again. Or if you are, that means like you need to fix something about yourself. You need to meditate more. <laughs> oh, yeah. You just need to like chill and like get Zen and centered. And, or if you're letting that bother you, you're not as spiritually evolved or something. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh gosh. And it, and it feels like these messages, right? Yeah. It feels like these messages that I think were coming from a really good place have actually gotten like they've, they've morphed into actually you're not allowed to be a whole human. And if you, if you have these different feelings or these different experiences, you need to go and like, yeah, you need to go and fix that. You need to make those changes. And that's really hard because like you're, everybody's a human. We're going to be sad. You're going to be angry. Like there's going to be days where you're really afraid or upset. And like, you know, I've, I've had depression and anxiety most of my life. And so feeling like that was a problem and that was something that was not okay. And that I was broken somehow because I couldn't just push past it. Like, oh, maybe I should just do more yoga. Maybe I should just overtrain my body more. And that will, <laughs> that will, uh, that will fix it. Right. And what I've like, what I've really found, and I see it in my clients a lot too, of that, like, that, like brushing aside of like, well, I'm just going to focus on the positive. And I'm like, that's awesome. Because I think there is a really real, like, there's a real expansion that's available when we can be optimistic and see things, see the bright side of things and have genuine gratitude and appreciation for like the lives that we lead and what we have. And it can also be used as a complete bypass and as a complete shutdown of the actual experience that you're having. And that's, that's where a lot of like my work ends up being both personally, honestly, and with other people is like, let me see what's required here to actually let my humanity be here and let myself be a whole person. Mm -hmm. Mm, thank you for sharing that. And especially because there's, when we learn about these different tools, when we learn about how, you know, our mindset, our beliefs can influence how we experience everything. It's almost like we think we can control like the circumstances like, oh, well, you know, I can reframe my mindset to feeling better. I can push through it. And so much of this pushing, which yes, comes from a good place. Sometimes we need to do this in order to survive. And then also reconciling with oh like how do I hold space and I feel like you know as coaches or even so much of your work it's like let me help you figure this out you know how do I hold your humanity and it's not always pretty in fact it is so uncomfortable to see ourselves for somebody to kind of reflect back at us like okay this is what I'm doing yeah a hundred percent and I think what you just touched on is like it can be really messy. Like being human is not this like neat, concise, like everything's clean and easy. It's, it is messy and chaotic. <laughs> and sometimes you're feeling a lot of things at once. Sometimes you don't know what to do next. And that's, those are the places I think that there's so much possibility and potential to like hold yourself or be, or have like be supported by somebody else. And it can be really scary, like, like that vulnerability thing that com comes back to that, like, oh, like, especially when all the messages coming in are like, just be happy, like, be grateful for what you have, or like, wow, those are really big feelings, like, maybe you should tone it down a little bit, that like, be appropriate, that like, those messages that we get in society. And like, I think we self, not like, not everybody, but I think a lot of us learn to self-police so that we wouldn't be too much, that you wouldn't be that that person you know that needy over intense person that nobody wants to be around yeah yeah how has that journey been for you as you step more into yourself and like reclaim your power and also hold joy creativity and also make space for your humanness how does that look like right now yeah yeah right now it looks like giving myself like very specific time every day to not be on my phone listening to an audiobook or podcast or whatever like because I I love input right about like my, my defined head in mind I'm like give me give me words give me things like I love <laughs> I love having that but it's like I also can use that to escape the feelings of my body and so it's I have to find like those times and spaces to just let myself 
feel. It's why I have my own coach. It's why I have a therapist. It's like, it's not because I necessarily feel like I need help. It's more like having somebody there to witness and be with me while I'm in that space can feel really, really supportive. Um, yeah. And it's also just looks like, um, you know, like I've, I've been doing a lot of grief excavation lately and it's, it's, it's the continual reminder that I'm not trying to solve my grief. I'm not trying to make it go away. I'm not trying to like, you know, get to the bottom of it because there's no bottom. Like there's, it's always going to be there. And it's more like, how can I make space for it in my life and build a relationship with the different feelings and emotions? And like, you know, part of, part of like what I do is like, I do parts work with people. And so it's like, how can I like connect with the parts that emerge and talk to them and be with all of the different parts of me and not try to like suppress them or deny them or, you know, yeah, control them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, tell me more about the work you do with grief. How, how did that come out and how do you, it's such a profound, complex feeling that we all, it's universal, but how yeah. we deal with it in society, you know, sometimes it's very, it's difficult for others to see someone else grieving and, you know, so much discomfort to move through. Yeah. 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 I mean, we're not taught how to be with grief in our societies, like not, not our own and not anybody else's. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that really started for me, like when my mom got diagnosed with cancer in 2016 and I'd have, I'd have grief experiences before that, but not that level. And when she passed away like a year and a half later, that was really the, the first time I've experienced like really acute loss like that. And it, it's interesting because I, I both like for the first time, I was really confronted with what it feels like to be in a prolonged period of grief and to not have capacity and energy or like care about <laughs> so many of the things I used to care about or like people pleasing or like trying to like do all the things I wanted to do. I, I just didn't, I didn't give, I just had no fucks to give, you know, I was just like, nope, I am here. Um, and then you know, that sort of flowed into the pandemic and the shutdown and the the grief of lost opportunities, missing connection with people, like all of these different things. It's like, it's compounded, but also like if I hadn't learned how to feel it, there's no way that like I could be here right now because it's so much, you know, there's the collective grief of everything happening in the world. There's all of it. And I think one of the things I try to remind myself is that it's not going anywhere. So I don't have to feel it all at once. But when it does arise, the most respectful thing I can do is to make space for it and let myself feel it like respectful to me, respectful to humanity, respectful to the actual feelings in me. Um, yeah. And it's, it's interesting too, because like the transformation work that I do with people often involves a lot, like whether it's literal death or just like loss of identity or like, oh, I need to shift and change into something new. I want to grow into this new way of being. So we have to release old patterns, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there's, a, there's grief there too. There's grief in making a decision you're really excited about, but it's cutting off the decisions and possibilities that you're choosing oh, yes. to pursue, right? Like grief is literally embedded in like all of the fibers of our reality. And we don't have a lot of practices for feeling it or being with it or like having rituals for it. And so that's something I would try to incorporate as well yeah. into my day. Mm -hmm. For someone who is dealing with grief, what is, I know it's very generic question that <laughs> is more nuanced person by person, but how does one start working with grief when it can feel so overwhelming and devastating to open that, take off that lid, especially if we've been trying not to feel it for so long? Yeah. Yeah. I think the first thing that like I would say is to just like how we get consent with other people to give advice or like, you know, ask questions or do other things. It's like, give yourself permission to close it back up whenever you need to. And like really tune in, like, can I get, like, do I have the consent of my body? Do I have the consent of my, my parts to actually start to tune into this? And if the answer is no, that's okay. You like, you, there, there is no like, all right, I'm going to go in and feel my grief today. And that's <laughs> going to be that, right. Like that's the end. It's like, it's a, it's a continual process. And so I think the first thing is to give yourself that permission of like, 
you don't have to feel it all at once and it might be overwhelming. So what can you do then? Then like, this would be the second part. It's like, what can you do to support yourself if you get overwhelmed? Like, what are the tools and practices that you have in place? Like, is it a grounding practice? Is it a breathing practice? Is it a movement practice? Like, can you, if you know you're going to kind of encounter your grief, Mm -hmm. what can you have on hand afterward to relax and like release and not think about it or feel it for a while? And, you know, that could be something that feels like, oh, I'm going to take a hot shower. I'm going to like, you know, journal or whatever, or it could be like, I'm going to lay on the couch and watch trashy TV and eat chocolate for a couple of hours, because that is actually what I need to come back to stasis. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I love these examples so much. And thank you for expanding on it because we often think of emotions or things that happen to us almost like static but grief is such an active energy like emotions are such an active energy but especially (laughs) grief I don't have a lot of experience with it like I've lost people I feel it coming and going but it's almost like you don't know when it's going to hit like it might be looking at a flower and then it just (gasps) comes and you know it wants to flow and just having those safety kind of parameters to be like okay I can come back to myself I can sob a little bit and then I can just regulate (laughs) however that Um, looks like yeah and I would say too you know like in a perfect world whenever like a feeling arises you can be like okay great let me just take some time and feel it and also like that's not the world we always live in right like you might have a wave of grief but you're about to walk into a meeting with your boss at work Mm -hmm. and so like taking that moment being like okay I'm feeling this it's not today, like right now is not the moment. And like, one of the things that I like to offer is, okay, great. Remind yourself, put it in your calendar for when you get home or like do something to be like, okay, I feel this. I am going to set it aside for now, but make that promise to yourself to come back to it and connect with it. And, you know, cause like, yeah, sometimes you don't want to have a breakdown in the middle of the mall, but <laughs> you know, maybe you wait till you get back to your car or something. Right, right. <laughs> sometimes it happens it's just coming up sometimes other times <laughs> how can we yeah, support ourselves yeah, and, and like sometimes we don't have the luxury of having a full breakdown when a feeling arises right and so giving yourself that space and like recognizing okay cool yeah I have commitments I have to honor I have things I need to do but that doesn't mean shove it aside forever it means like intentionally give it give it a little space but come back mm-hmm. Has your relationship with to grief, you know, to your emotions changed over time? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's funny. Like I always joke that I'm like, I have a Virgo moon. Right. And so I really like to solve my feelings. Like if they don't have a purpose, (laughs) why am I feeling them? Especially with my undefined solar reflexes. I'm like, what's the point of this? (laughs) Especially that mental definition. It's going to make sense of it. hundred percent. And that's, it's honestly, I think why I, I love supporting people through emotions and feeling and like felt sense so much because it's something I've had to learn how to do so deeply. And like, it's, I, I will still, especially if I'm stressed or I'm like, oh, like, can I just, what is the, what am I feeling right now? Why am I feeling it? What do I need to do? Like, I'll, I'll try and like logic my way through it. <laughs> and I have yeah. to come back to like, take a moment. What if there is no purpose and you just need to feel it and like, let, let myself feel it. And I feel like I have a lot more space now to do that than I used to, because I used to just see my emotions as really inconvenient. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. like, listen, I have things to do. Like, what's happening right now? <laughs> I, I love that. I remember going to therapy like a few years ago and I was still I have I'm very logical like I I understand why this is happening I understand where the trigger is coming from but like why is it not going away like what else can I do with it and my brain was very much like you know solve it like you're anxious okay take some deep breaths but it was all very surface level it was like mechanical (laughs) do it because it is a tool that can help people but I was so I didn't I felt so connected and disconnected to myself at the same time if that made any sense Oh, it totally makes sense. And I think that's like, oh, it's, I think that's such a, I don't know if it's a whole human tendency. It just feels like a human tendency to be like, okay, I have the tool that's supposed to fix this. Like I did the thing, but we like forget the step of like, be present with the thing. Right? I'm feeling it. I'm feeling my body. I feel the uh, tension. Feel it. I hate it. Am I, is, am I done now? Right? Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I love it. It makes sense, especially just given the world we live in. We live in a very like cause effect, like logic, like transactional world. Like if I have this, then I should do this. If this happens, then this happens, right? But that's not how feelings work. <laughs> that's not embodiment and embodiment is hard. It's not, there's no time frame. That's what I realized. I don't know if you've noticed in your coaching practices, some clients come to me, it's like, okay, this is the energy I'm working with. So knowing that my solar plexus is undefined, knowing that I have these energies, how do I solve it? And I'm always like, I'll give you more questions to contemplate. Yeah. I'm sorry. I can't bring certainty. How do you hold that? Because we are supporting people, but also holding them in a journey that it, there's no prescription for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I see that, that desire to figure it out, like to have the puzzle pieces, like that's a part, that's a part inside of each of us that like, and for me, I know that part comes out when it doesn't feel safe to feel the feelings or it, like mm -hmm. something doesn't feel safe. And it's like, okay, I need to, I need to solve this. And it's trying to protect you. Right. It's trying to like help yeah. you but it's not actually you. It's just a part of you that is getting activated when those emotions or like big things come up. And so I like to have a conversation with it of like, you know, what, okay, what do you have to share with me right now? Like, what is it you're needing? Like, what is feeling unsafe? And like, just, I mean, I talk to the voices in my head all the time. <laughs> I'm like, What's going on here? Like, and not because I'm trying to get rid of it or fix it or anything, but just to like understand what's happening and to see if there is any, any space for that part to like feel a little bit better that like oh wait it doesn't actually have to come in and like hijack my whole reality and like try and take over and I think that's a really a really big um a big part of it is that like especially when clients come in they're like cool I'll talk to that part but then what right and it's like no like that's it that's all that you do <laughs> and it's like and it, it makes sense right it's like that desire to figure yourself out it's like there's like, I also am always curious of like, well, what's underneath that? Like, what do you think is, what do you think is going to happen? When, like, if you, if you solve the puzzle of who you are and how to do it. And it's like, usually it's like, oh, like, I won't have to doubt myself anymore. I won't have any questions. Like, I won't have to like, you know, strive. I won't have to do all these things. And it's like, okay, so you're trying, like, we're, well, we're trying to like cut out the mystery of being human, mm -hmm. basically. <laughs> Yes, because I don't think anybody has taught us, at least a lot of Western society, like how to hold the uncertain. So much of it is like, you do this and you'll feel better. You have this and you'll do that. And we got sold that certainty, which yes, sometimes does lead to that. Yeah. It's not all. And I we've talked a little about this. It's like, how do we you know, embrace the tools, learn it, but also remain sovereign in our power? How do we not just give away our certainty, our power, like, okay, the stars are here. So I'm feeling like this. I'm just going to let it happen. Right. That's the extreme, <laughs> but yeah, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. I mean, I do that. I'll, I'll do that sometimes. I'll be like, oh, well, you know, this gate is activated. So that must be why I'm feeling this way. <laughs> like, well, maybe, but also like, how am I engaging with that? Right. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, it can be, it can be, complicated to engage with different systems like human design or astrology or you know anything without giving it your power and I think it's I think it's kind of like a dance sometimes right it's not like I will never give my power to this thing again it might be more like oh I'm I'm doing that I'm trying to explain something through this system what is that about like why like what is there something I'm avoiding is there something I need to tend to is there something that I am like wanting to not take responsibility for? So I want to like blame this system. <laughs> oh, yes. Can we talk a little bit more about accountability? Not mm -hmm. saying that, you know, people want to give their, like nobody wants to give their power away. And I think it's all part of the process. When we learn something, it's so mental. We want to do it, right? Because I'm totally that person. I'm like, okay, when I first learned yoga, perfect poses and, you know, human design. Yeah. okay, how can you be a great projector? How can I wait nicely? You know, all those things. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and then it's almost like, oh, there's a shift. It's almost like when we start to embody the things that we have been integrated mentally, it's like, oh, something shifts, something clicks. And then we're like, ah, then we can see the bigger picture or whatever's underneath. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that process happens over and over again, right? 
Um, yeah. And I think that's, oh God, I relate so much to the, like the perfect alignment in yoga. And like, if I can just fit my body into this shape, then I will be this like perfect yoga goddess. Right. <laughs> and I can do a headstand. <laughs> and I'm like, why am I like, it's fun if we could do it. Like, you know, but sometimes we attach so much meaning to, to an idea of ourselves. Yeah. Or this idea of what, you know, what a, whether it's a movement system or a understanding yourself system, like if I can, it's, it's another way I think of going, like, I don't think we do this consciously. Right. But it's like, if I can fit myself into this in a way that makes sense and it's like, then everything will be okay. Like that's where it goes to, right. Like then I'll be happy. Then I won't have to worry. Then I'll be accepted and loved. And you know, all of these things that I think that internally we worry that we're not able to do on our own. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think too, it's like, you know, that, that giving, giving power or abdicating responsibility to it, like, it can feel safer than saying like, okay, so what if I am a projector? Like, what if that doesn't mean anything? What if this whole thing is made up? Then how do I proceed? Or like, I, I have had this with, um, like with my energy because I have like some chronic fatigue stuff that flares up every once in a while. Like I've had lots of burnout cycles. Right. And so when I notice my energy flagging or like my stress levels getting higher, there are parts of me that panic. They're like, Oh my God, you're going to be bed rest. Like you have to call, you have to stop. You have to be really still. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. This doesn't work because then I just, I just get tense and then the stress just ramps up. Right. And so one of the questions that I ask myself all the time is if I never had any more energy than this on a day-to-day -day basis, how would I proceed? You know, if I never got past this emotion, how would I proceed? If I, and like, you know, when I got diagnosed with my hypermobility disorder and I had a bunch of injuries and instabilities, I was like, if I never feel differently than I do today, mm -hmm. where do I, like, what do I want to be doing? And it's hard to ask those questions because I don't want to, like, when I have those moments, I don't want to feel that way. I and I know that there are other possibilities available, right? But it takes me out of the fantasy of, well, when I get a good night's sleep, then I'll do all of these things. When I don't, when I like X happens, then I, then I can do all of these things that I want to be doing. And it doesn't mean, and it also is like a really real like capacity thing. It's like, oh yeah, if I don't ever have any more capacity in this, I did this when I was like in my deep grief too of like, I was exhausted all the time, but I didn't just need, I didn't just want to completely stop my life because that didn't feel good either. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like, okay, what capacity do I have to engage with my life, to create, to work or not? Right. And it's hard to ask those questions, especially because like so much of my reality was constructed around like, well, when you have this level of energy, this level of health, whatever health means, when you have, you know, this amount of money, this, 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 that's when everything is great, right? And if we take that completely off the table, one, it's very confronting, but two, it opens up different possibilities that maybe you never even considered. And I feel like those are opportunities that allow us to tap into the creativity they're one of many gateways, but I know a lot of the work you do is also like, how do we tap into the creativity and also rebirth <laughs> so many places uh, to go? Where do you want to go? I'm like, I want to ask everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the interesting thing about creativity is that like it, in some ways it actually thrives with limitation. Mm. Like if we, if we just stay in infinite possibility, potential land, nothing actually gets created. Like you have to choose you have to make a decision you have to start something and I don't know about you but like some of the best art that I ever made was art that had parameters it was like well you can only use the color red or you know this is the theme of this series of paintings that you're doing because it, it puts up like boundaries right so that's not just everything's floating out there and it's like if, I think you know you think about creative flow it's like if it's like a river the river needs the riverbanks <laughs> like it needs to it needs to flow in a direction otherwise it all just sort of like filters out and there doesn't go anywhere right. and so like a lot of times people will come to me and be like I want to be more creative I need more time I need more space I need a whole day on my calendar I'm like 
Cool. Totally understand. Yes. And when you have a whole day free on your calendar, what do you actually do with it? And it's like, oh, I panic. I'm like, yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> because we can oh. do everything and nothing. It's almost like we paralyze our body with the possibilities. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like when you invite limitation in as an asset instead of something that's like holding you back, it can open up so much space because you go, okay. I realistically have about 45 minutes today in which I know I can be like upright and creating and doing something awesome. What am I going to do in that 45 minutes? I'm not going to try and get an entire list of creative projects done, right? I'm going to hone in on what feels most important. What's, you know, what's most alive in me or like, what's the thing that's going to make me money if that's where you're going, like whatever it is, right? Yeah. It, it helps to get rid of the indecision. I think a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. I definitely feel that I'm so much more productive when I'm like, Oh, I have two hours to work on this before something else. And then if I have a whole day, I'm like, well, I have 50,000 things I can do. I can do X, Y, and Z, like do all the things. And I'm realizing my capacity, like my body has been exhausted for a while, maybe just lying down and then the guilt. And then like all these things that bubble up and it's like, okay, how do we <laughs> hold this space for ourselves and still do the things we want to do? Because we're not here to be blobs. <laughs> Nobody right. wants to be a blob. <laughs> right. Well, and, it's, and, like, and then it, there's always like, when is being a blob actually restful? And when is it just like, I don't know what to do right now. So now I'm stuck. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that happens to me a lot. I'll be totally honest. Same here. Same here. That was my morning. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I think that's, that's super real. I think especially to like, I don't know about you, like just there's a lot of language out there, are out there, like for projectors in particular, that's like, well, you don't want to work too much. You can only work four hours a day. Like oh you yeah. don't like, you need to rest all the time. And it's like, yeah, cool. And I actually have more energy when I move my body regularly. If I sit still or lay down for too long, I just start to get tense and like nothing happens if I, and then, yeah, then the thoughts come to be like, I should be doing this. I should be doing that. I should be doing all these different things. That's not restful. Right. And sometimes rest isn't actually laying down or being still or like scrolling on your phone. Right. Sometimes rest is going for a walk. Sometimes rest is reading a book. Sometimes it's actually like doing all of your dishes because it feels really restful in your nervous system to have a clean kitchen. Right. Like, yeah. There's so many different ways to look at that. <laughs> yes. And I love you brought that up for like the examples of projectors. So I think a lot of it, that's why I said, like, I'm so grateful that I got to do all my healing mindset work before I got to human design, because knowing myself, I would have held on to it and be like, well, four hours and then bitterness happens. Like, well, my husband is a sacred generator. He has not been moving his body and this sacred energy is keeping me up. You know, it's so easy to twist that information and blame. And maybe that's also part of the process, you know, especially if we've been operating outside of ourselves and we find something that finally sees us. It's like, ah, oh, you see me. So these are the rules that I will feel better. But then it's almost like life is not, not a strict series of rules. Like we, this idea of being a proper projector, <laughs> I've seen this narrative and I'm like, this feels so scary <laughs> for me because we're suddenly now put into another box that we're not aware of, another category. And then suddenly those limitations that is support supposed to support our capacity to create, to do the things we want becomes a box that says we can't do the things because we'll never have enough energy. Yeah. Dangerous. It's, it's act it's actually dangerous the way that it can be prescriptive and yeah, it's, Oh, I have so many things that <laughs> are there, but it's, again, it comes back to like, you have to, take radical responsibility for yourself. And I'm not talking about just I'm responsible for me and nobody else, like at the expense of everybody else. Right. I'm talking about like, yeah, you might have a chart in front of you. You might have people saying, this is what this means, but have you actually tried it and experimented for yourself? Like I, you know, like, yeah, I learned about being a projector after I'd been an athlete my, my whole life. Mm. And like, my thought wasn't, I should stop playing sports. It was like, oh, that's really interesting. Like, I wonder what's here for me, right? 
I've had people ask me like, how do you do endurance training? You're a projector. You don't have any motor centers. And I was like, it doesn't, that's not, that's not what that means. <laughs> that's not what it means. Like look at Serena <laughs> Williams. She's a mental projector. I think yeah. like, there's so many people out there that are capable of doing things that sometimes the information falls flat on or is limited, but I understand where it came from and the intention behind it. That's oh. why it's like, it's, there's so many thoughts around it. And I, I think you shared in your stories recently about how you were just, you know, watching this workshop and it became very prescriptive. And that's kind of like the fear that I see, not just in human design, but in so many astrologies, wellness industry, where suggestions become prescription. And then it's almost like the Holy Bible. If you're not following that, then that's the reason for your bitterness. Totally. I mean, it's like having in yoga too, right? Like, God forbid you put your knees over your toes and your toes. <laughs> Honestly, you're going to die. And then I saw another movement thing like years later, they're like, no, you can strengthen your knees by doing that. Actually, it's not that scary. It's actually a very normal like way of being, right? Yeah. It, for our bodies to like a functional movement for our bodies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So many things like that, but it's like, I think, I think it comes down to like, we're so trained to look for what's going to keep me safe. What's going to give me the answer. What's the way to do it that like, I mean, even I'll do that, like, or, or I'll find something that even if I have experimented on my own, I'm like, this is what works for me. And I'll forget like, well, that's what works for me right now, but that doesn't mean it's going to work for me forever. And I have to, you have to keep tuning back into yourself and being present with what's actually here. Ooh. Right. Yes, yes. And that might be like a perfect way to lead into rebirth. But I've noticed as I tend to myself, tune into myself, the practices that worked so well years ago that always, you know, bring me back now, I don't feel pulled to it. And it's helped me sometimes to have the language, either human design, variables, whatever it is, to be like, oh, you know, you might be in a season of change. And it just helps me click into that path easier instead of less fighting it and be like well I used to journal every day like this is a journal like I don't want to journal I just don't for a while and then there will be some nights that I do and the format looks different so rebirth is something that we're continuously going through how has that popped up in your <laughs> in your life yeah. yeah I mean you know, I am a, like, yes, I have a defined identity center, but I'm a third line. Like I have lived so many lives and had so many jobs and like I've lived in so many different places. And it's, it's an interesting thing because a lot of, I think a lot of the pain that comes from feeling like you're starting anew is that you don't have your go-tos to fall back on. And it's, it's like, oh yeah, that, that doesn't feel the way it used to exactly like you're talking about like with journaling, right? Like that used to do so much. And now it like, if you try and do it every day, it's like, ugh, like, I don't want to do this. Like this doesn't, it doesn't create what it used to. Right. And so like, I mean, I think, I mean, birth is messy, right? Like birth is not a clean, like easy process. It is messy. It is painful. It hurts. <laughs> it completely changes your reality. Um, and like, I think when we can embrace the mess a little bit and like recognize again, being human is inherently chaotic. <laughs> you know how like, okay. So you know, how like a lot of people will say like you're half human and half divine. So like lean into your divinity or whatever. So one of my favorite fantasy series growing up was, um, <laughs> was, it was, it was written by Tamara Pierce. And in the fourth <laughs> book of the series, which is called in the realm of the gods, they talk about how humans there's the human realm there's the divine realm and there's the chaos realm and, and humans are half divine and half chaos and I remember reading that as a kid and that just like clicked in my head of like yes half divine divine order like everything is working out perfectly and half chaos like utter nonsense like yes. nobody knows what's going on <laughs> and and I think that like especially in a in a period of of rebirth like whether that's you're shifting jobs, you're changing, you're ending a relationship, you're going through grief, you're deciding to start on a new project. Like maybe you're like, okay, I want to write a novel for the first time. And I don't know how to do that. So I need to like become an author or a writer in some way, like whatever it is, right? Leaning on both, like, yes, leaning on the divine mm -hmm. side of things. Like everything is working out. I can have faith. I can trust that there's a pattern to all this, but also leaning on the chaos and being like, yes. some of this is just not going to make sense. <laughs> And it's going to be messy and weird. And I'm not going to be able to make a plan for it or like predict what's going to happen. 
Oh, I love this book. <laughs> <laughs> we need both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think like, especially in a lot of wellness spaces, there's so much leaning toward like, everything is working out. Just be calm. Just go into it again. Like that, like, like bypassing and denying the other parts of us. And it's like, yeah, I can trust that. But if I'm not willing to lean into the messiness or like experiment with things and like try things out and like build a relationship with failure and confusion and uncertainty, it's not going to, it's not going to feel nearly as like enlivening or supportive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it almost makes me think of like, it's such a childlike approach. Like when we're children and we're playing, we don't think about like, this is the five-year plan. This is the 10 week plan. We just playing. We're just for the sake of, and things get so messy and dirty. And then, you know, we need to take a bath or <laughs> we scrape ourselves, but this is such a part of the process. I love, like when you say divinity and chaos, my body was like, yes, you know, because <laughs> the magic is in the chaos, the magic is in the shadows, but we're so afraid of them. We're so terrified of what's underneath of seeing ourselves. And also like part of the rebirth is also meeting a different version of ourselves. How do we make space for that without trying to hold on to the old versions of ourselves because that worked? That is kind of like the shedding period of like, oh, maybe you're someone who can drink coffee at night. I don't know. I'm just throwing a super random thing. <laughs> right? I yeah. cannot, <laughs> but <Yeah. you> know, <laughs> maybe a different version of you is coming out. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it can feel really destabilizing. I think even if you're moving toward what you want, it can feel destabilizing when the the fallbacks don't work or all the things where you're like, well, I, I'm a person who x y or z and you're like maybe i'm not that person anymore or like yeah i could never i'm gonna use your example i could never drink <laughs> coffee after 12 p.m and then it's like 1 30 and you have a cold brew and like oh wait i actually slept fine yeah. that night who even am i right yeah. <laughs> like maybe that's a superficial example but i think that is like that's like that's the gist of it is it's like oh if we're not willing to try things although please do not go and drink copious <laughs> just to try it out right <laughs> I mean do what you want you're you know. <laughs> um but it, it can feel really strange or if you know one of the things that I think I've heard from clients especially before is like I'm not somebody who can use a schedule I hate my calendar I can't I can't use a calendar even though like all they want is structure and it's like okay cool like there's something here yeah. to get into not because you need to use a calendar in the way that I use a calendar or in the way anybody else does, but there's like a, it's like, there's the longing for something and then the force against it. Oh, so yes. Go, and the resistance. What? Yeah. So like, let's, let's get it right in the center there and look at what's going on. Okay. Here, right? <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. I love when there is resistance because I feel like that's, that's also where, that's where the magic is. That's almost like, it's not that you're sabotaging yourself, abandoning, whatever it is, but it's almost like the resistance to do it. One, wants to keep you safe. Two, mm -hmm. certain stories that you're holding and, you know, maybe needs to be re-evaluated. And I don't know why the story is coming up, but I, there was a year, a few years ago, right before the pandemic, where I was seeing a naturopath and suddenly before finding out about human design. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, I think the reason that I'm tired is because I'm not getting vitamin D. I'm not eating magnesium. I'm not like, so I was getting all those supplements. And then I think my body had such a reaction where I was doing all the right things. Then I developed allergies, things that I could eat all the time. Suddenly, oh no, you've been allergic to these your whole life. I'm like, wait, what, oranges? Like citrus? And then when I got the things back, the results back, the only few things I wasn't allergic to was chocolate. I'm like, thank God, because I love chocolate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but little things like potato, carrots, I was allergic. I'm like, how is that possible? And then I clung on to that. I'm like, that's the reason I've been feeling tired. That's the reason I wasn't feeling mine. So I cut off everything and I was so miserable and then my naturopath one day was like, I mean, you can have fries if you want. It's not going to kill you. Like, it's better to be relaxed than to be like, Ugh. and I was definitely the approach of like, completely, like, I'm going to do it perfectly. I'm going to cut off everything. I'm going to, you know, that energy that we bring with good intentions because we want to heal. We want to feel better <laughs> yeah. and sometimes end up costing us more and it wasn't until I kind of just I'm gonna eat whatever I want and I actually did get better <laughs> you know so not saying that is not my advice for people eat whatever you want but you know there are yeah. times where that was supportive and then I held on to that for so long and I was fearful around food I was fearful because I just yeah 
And that, that fear, it's almost like it ends up eating you in the inside too. Yeah, it absolutely does. And funny that you use that, like that food example. Cause like I, I had an opposite experience of like doing some food sensitivity testing and I, um, I ended up being really sensitive to peanuts and almonds and like, I love peanut butter. I love almond butter. And I remember being like, no, I absolutely will not give those up. And I kind of had this whole thing. I was like, I have a history of an eating disorder. I have to do this. Like I had all of these different things that panic in my system that was like, no, I need these things. And then like, I ate more of them than I ever had before for like six months. And then like, I was like, okay. And I started working with like, okay, what's going on here. Right. But like, I slowly started to like settle out of it because I could feel it in my body that it wasn't actually useful. And I, I don't, it's not that I never eat peanut butter or almond butter now, but I don't eat them every single day. Like I used to, and I do feel better, but like, I really had to like compassionately care for all of those parts of me and all those identity pieces that were like, no, this is a core part of who I am. Like it might sound silly, but like literally peanut butter is a core part of who I am. Right. <laughs> You're half peanut butter, half blood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I had, and like, it, it took time for me to do that. And I think that happened because like, we'll, we'll see something like, like, I'll go I'll, because this is something that happens a lot. I'll have I'll have people who are like, I really want to write a book, yeah. and it's like all of this stuff comes up about here's why I can't, or okay, I'm gonna do it, and it's gonna look exactly like this, and this is my schedule, and I have to write these many words every single day, and it's like sometimes one or the other will take the extreme, and sometimes yeah. both happen at once, and it's like ha ah! ha like they have, like the parts just fight, <laughs> right? And so we really have to like get into those like those tense places and like squishy places not to like oh uh, like dig in and poke at it but to be like something's here there's some really potent like magic stardust or whatever here right there's something here but we have to be with what's here first before getting into it before actually like kind of coming to your own way of doing things we have to look at what are all of the pieces that are holding on really hard before getting into that like, okay, this is who I'm, this is, I am becoming this, but there's a lot of the shedding that happens first once you make that decision. Oh yes. The being part where we're not doing anything yet with it. I think that's the part that I know I would skip. I was like, oh, I know what's happening. It's like, no, just be with it. And then we can problem solve if it comes. But I I love that. It's almost like I see the theme of what we're talking about so much about like, how do we hold space for ourselves? If we, even if we don't know how that looks like, even if it might seem something we're not used to doing, it's really holding that space to tend. It's almost like you're just, you know, you're not a baby, but you know, just like tending to a baby, they take an hour to eat and then they need another hour to burp. I don't know how kids work yet. <laughs> That's my <laughs> assumptions. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it is, it's like, it, it really is like, just taking care of ourselves is like continually like parenting yourself as if you're a toddler, right? It's like, it's like, okay, what do we need? Do we feel safe? Are you hungry? Like, <laughs> do you need sunshine? Like what's going on, right? <laughs> yes. Do you need a nap? There was this video that was going around where this little toddler was like crying, sobbing. <laughs> and her brother, who might be like a year or two older, is like, are you okay? Did you have a nap today? And the kid's like, no, I didn't. And it's almost like sometimes it's as simple as that. It's just tending to our body. Sometimes it doesn't have to be a big thing. Other times it can. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, it's like a lot of times, you know, especially like, I know people that I work with, me too, like my, my fallback when I'm like wanting to figure, like stress is like, I need to figure this out. I need to make a plan. I need to like somebody sent me a, a meme that was like it was like I'm on the verge of a full complete breakdown I think I just need to make a plan and put some things into categories and then everything will work out and I was like yep that <laughs> that's what I do <laughs> um and I think yeah we either try to like over plan or over control things to try and seek safety or come up with all the reasons why it's not a good idea to seek safety and stay where you are right it's like okay I'm gonna go here I'm gonna have all the tools and all the plans I'm never gonna like I'm gonna figure out what all the obstacles are ahead of time doesn't work right and then or it's like 
and I'm not saying it's as simple as one or the other, because a lot of times, like I said, both are happening. Yeah. And so it can feel like this like push and pull in your system of, and then what can come up underneath that is the self-judgment, the shame, the guilt, the what's wrong with me. And it's like, those are the places we have to, we have to explore because when you can find what's driving those, mm. you can actually create so much freedom for yourself because you don't have to be moving from those places anymore. What does freedom look for you look like for you right now? I think there's so many different kinds of freedom. Um, I mean, I definitely have a lot of time freedom. Like I'm fortunate in that. And it's, you know, we're talking about structure earlier. Like freedom for me actually looks like really like focused planning of what am I doing every week and like writing down every single possible thing I can think of that needs to happen. And even if it doesn't all get done, I schedule it all out. And then like, I can move things around and like put it, put them off to the next week. But freedom actually looks like not having to think about what am I doing every single day? It's mm -hmm. like, okay, it's already my calendar. I did that on Sunday night. Like I know, I know what's here. And of course, freedom also looks like if I have, say I have like, I'm going to go for a run on my calendar and I don't sleep well and I feel exhausted. Like I can change that, mm -hmm. right? I don't have to, I don't have to stick to it no matter what. So freedom also looks like that presence with my body to look at like what's really needed here and trusting it and flowing with whatever is needed. Thank you for sharing. What are the type of work that you do so that the people that are looking to work with you, collaborate with you, what does Kate Merrill offer right now currently? I know you have a <laughs> couple of group programs and retreats. Yeah, yeah. I'm primarily doing one-on-one -on -one work right now, like coaching work. So I have a couple of like single session or like shorter programs. And I also have some longer term coaching. Um, I always tell people to look though, because every time I say I'm not, I don't have anything, then I'll like start a group program or <laughs> I'll create a course or something. And so a lot of, and a lot of it has to do with courage and self-leadership and, you know, walking your edges of creative expression and self-expression. And I support people a lot from like, a kind of like the, the burnout to vitality space. So if you find yourself in that kind of area like that's I love I love really supporting people and creating that like foundation of nourishment and care and building capacity from that place mm -hmm. um yeah I have so many things I could say but <laughs> we'll please there. share more <laughs> what more is there <laughs> let me no, ask me <laughs> yeah that's most of it um you know I do a lot I do do a lot of like if you find yourself in that place of like death or void or rebirth like let's build a vision. Let's really look at where you're going and what you're wanting to create in your next era of life and, and really build it from the inside out instead of mind down and outside in. I love that. I love that. What are some supportive practices that you're leaning on in this season of your life? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, daily movement is an absolute must for me and it doesn't have to be anything intense, but you know, like I do have a hypermobility disorder and I find that if I don't move like intentionally every single day, my joints hurt, my like stuff gets out of whack. Like I have to do stuff. And so I, I actually work with a, her name's Donnell Arthur. She does movement therapy classes. She was actually the one who taught me how to teach yoga all the time, like years and years and years ago. And so that's, like um, a must to do every single day, whether it's for 10 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. Um, yeah. And then also just like, I love to go wander around my neighborhood and like very specifically walk without music or anything in my ears and just like, let my mind wander while I walk and see what, see what shows up. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Do you have any thoughts that are floating around that wants to be expressed right now? <laughs> like always <laughs> I'm like what's here um I think what's really just here is that everything we talked about maybe sounds complicated but joy is actually really simple it's all of this other stuff like all of the conditioning and all of the the survival strategies that we've put into place necessarily right that make it feel complicated like it's actually really simple but it also takes courage especially in the world that we live in to decide that you're going to orient to joy and to like move in your life actively toward the things that bring you joy and satisfaction and fulfillment instead of just trying to minimize pain and suffering. Mm. How does one conjure courage within themselves? 
Mm, yeah. It's a big question. <laughs> a big question, but also, again, it, it's actually pretty simple. <laughs> One, it's a muscle. It has to be practiced, mm -hmm. right? And so to me, courage is, I mean, you know, the root of the word core is heart in Latin, right? And so it's really, it's like, what is in your heart that's wanting to come out and be expressed? And courage really, I think it's activated when those fears, the doubts, the uncertainties, the anxiety comes up and tries to stop you from expressing what's in your heart and doing what's in your heart. And the courage is, I'm actually going to move through these things and face them in order to be more me, in order to express more of who I am in the world. I'm just taking this in. That was so beautiful. <laughs> I'm like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And then a final question I have for you. What would you say to young Kate right now? Mm. Keep being curious. Like, keep reading, keep asking questions, keep making things. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me for such an amazing conversation. So fun. <laughs> so fun. So much fun. Um, where can people find you? Yeah, you can find me. My website is my name, katemerolt.com, or you can find me on Instagram, kate underscore merolts. Pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we talk about all the deep things and there's like, it's also simplicity in it. <laughs> I love that. And, yeah, simple, not necessarily easy. I think oh, that's a distinction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's make this into a, a logo, a tagline. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. If you're feeling pulled to get into action and want to connect within, check out the Align and Embody journal on wholeandunleashed.com. You'll also find resources on mindset, human design, and archive for past episodes of this podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share, leave a comment or review on iTunes and Spotify. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a wonderful day wherever you are.